Hi, ah, so as you know, I've come up with this conductive ink, uh, and I'm pretty pleased with it actually. I've managed to get the resistance down to about 40 ohms a centimetre, which with this kind of ink is pretty good when you think of the inks of this category around 140 ohms a centimetre. So I'm pretty pleased with it really. But having made it, and, and particularly I made it for electroplating, having made it made me think about what else you could do with it. Now, I'm not an electronics expert, not by any means. I, I know enough to get me by, as it were, but having worked on this made me start to think about what else you could do. Now, modern electronics doesn't really look at the electricity per se, it thinks about the current in terms of a signal, and it thinks about the components in terms of signal processing, that is, changing the signal from one form to another to do a job. And in order to do that, what it does is uses components, and the components are split into two parts. You have the so-called active components and the passive components. Now, the active components are things like um, transistors and ICs, and the passive components are things like resistors and capacitors. It occurred to me that it would actually be relatively simple to draw passive components uh, using that conductive ink, and so that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to be making passive components on paper using conductive ink. And this is by way of talking through it, and then what we'll do is we'll go off and make some example circuits, drawing the um, passive components. So that's the plan. Now, <coughs> the two main components we're going to look at making are resistors and capacitors. And a good way of thinking about these things is using the water analogy. So if we think about water flowing through a pipe, and we have a, a big old pipe, then we're going to get a lot of water flowing through there easily. If we restrict that pipe diameter, then you need either a lot more force or you have to put up with very little water coming through. And that's what a resistor does. It restricts the flow of water or flow of electricity or restricts the signal. And that's the whole point of it. Now, that resistance is, um, in terms of ink, it can actually be physical like this. So, if I have my line of ink, so there's my conductive line, and I want to join it up to another conductive line, and I put a thin line between the two, that thin line of ink will act like a resistor, and you can measure the resistance of it between these two points, and it'll have a specific value. So one way is to actually just draw the line thinner, or draw it with less thickness on it, so that there's a restriction in the pipe, and that will be a resistor. Now, another way of doing it is to increase the path that it has to follow. So if I have a line, then between this point and this point, because it's made out of this conductive ink, there's a resistance R1. Now, if I take the same points, but I join it up by a longer line, so physically the path is actually longer, then that resistance R2 will be bigger than R1, quite simply just because it has a longer line to follow. So there's two methods you can use to actually paint resistors. If we look at a cross-sectional area of it, so here's our paper, here's our painted line, here's our painted line, and we paint it thinner like that, then because that cross-sectional area is larger than that cross-sectional area, then the resistance here will be greater than the resistance here. So there's another way of actually making a resistor out of this thing. So you can paint the lines on, change the width of them, change the thickness of them, or change the distance that they travel, to actually construct resistors out of something like conductive ink. Now, obviously, there's a, something else you could do with that. So if we have a line, and we connect it to an arm, then if we put it in that position there, because the distance is short, it'll have a resistance of R1. If we put it in that there, then the distance is much longer, so we have a resistance of R2, and because the distance is longer, in this case, resistance 2 is greater than the resistance 1. Now if that line is movable, so we can sweep it up and down, then what we have is potentiometer. or a variable resistor. So we can make uh, standard resistors and variable resistors quite simply just by painting lines on the paper of different thicknesses, different widths and different travel distances to create resistors. So creating resistors 
actually is not particularly challenging. Now, <clears throat> the second thing we can do is create a capacitor. Now, a capacitor is a bit more of a problematic thing. It's, it's a bit more difficult to understand because what it consists of is two plates joined up. So, in standard circuit theory, we always think about things being joined or they won't flow. And here we have actually a break, and, and it's a bit confusing about why it's actually happening there. Another good way of looking at this is, is to look at it as a pipe. Now, in this case, what we've got in the pipe is a little bit of rubber. As we force water into that pipe, that rubber is going to bend. If we turn off the water, then there's actually energy stored in that bent rubber. So as that bent rubber tries to go back into its original shape, it's going to force the water back out. So that push and relax of the rubber in the pipe is actually how energy is stored. The energy is stored between the plates here in an electrical field. I guess that's one way of looking at it, and quite a good way, actually. Now, capacitors physically are two conductive plates separated by a non-conductive plate. And that non-conductive plate is called the dialectic. So what you very often have is a plate of uh, polyethylene, uh, some kind of plastic, you can use paper, you can use air, uh, you can use glass, there's lots of things you can use. And at the top and bottom of it you attach a conductive plate that you then put into your circuit. And the um, power of that capacitor, that is how much energy it can store, is obviously related to the size of the plate, which is the area of the plate. It has something to do with the nature of the dialectic, something called the dialectic constant, and it has something to do with the distance between the two plates. Now, you can calculate the capacitance, and uh, forgive me as I check my notes. <coughs> and the actual capacitance of this is C equals K, uh, 0 0.24, sorry, 2248A all over D. Now, you don't need to really worry about that calculation. Uh, there are plenty of capacitance calculators available on the internet for you that'll actually just work that out for you. But there is this direct formula that relates the area of the plate to the distance of the part to the uh, dialectic that they've actually got between them. Now, the dialectic constant of um, paper is, uh, I think, 3.85. Craft paper is about 2.6 or something like that. Normal paper is about 3.85. The thickness of um, card stock, so you get yourself a bit of a uh, birthday card or something like that, the thickness of the card stock is normally about 0.254 millimetres. Now, if I plug those figures into there and calculate the capacitance, I can actually work out what areas that I'm going to have to give me a given capacitance. Or I can calculate what um, what capacitance I've got for the area that I paint. So say I've got a bit of card. <coughs> so there's my bit of card. And I paint on a square as part of my circuit. And on the reverse side of the card, I paint on another square. Then what I've done is I've made a capacitor. A capacitor. Now if that square is one centimetre by one centimetre, then the capacitance is actually going to be zero point zero one three nanofarads, which is really really small. If I change that to ten centimeters by ten centimeters, then the capacitance is going to be at one point three nanofarads, which is much better. And actually, that kind of figure is usable in in normal circuits and the kind of circuits you want to build. Now obviously 10 centimetres by 10 centimetres is quite large, and if you want to make it any larger, you're going to run into problems. But <coughs> you can set up capacitors in parallel or series. So if I set them up in parallel like that, so what I've done is I've got two bits of paper, painted my sides, painted my sides and stacked them on top of each other and made the parallel connection, then that capacitor has a capacitance, that capacitor has a capacitance, and the total capacitance 
is just the sum of the two small capacitances. So you can keep on making a capacitor by making plates, stacking them on top of each other and painting a line between them all to connect them all. So you can make that capacitor no bigger, certainly thicker, but as big as you like by painting on paper. Now there's another way of um, <coughs> forming a capacitor and that's in series. Not as useful to us because the total capacitance of uh, an in-series collection of capacitors is actually less than an individual capacitor. So this C total is 1 over 1 over C1 plus 1 over C2, C3. Okay, so that's how you work out the total capacitance for an in-series capacitor network. Now, the problem with that is it's not very usable because that's always very small. But if you have a high voltage that you want, and you want to uh, put it through a circuit that would normally blow out your dielectric, the voltage is actually spread over those, and so it will take a much higher voltage. This one will take a lower voltage, but it has a higher capacitance. This will take a lower capacitance, but it's able to cope with a higher voltage. Now we're not working with terribly high voltages, and we'll want high capacitances. So it's in parallel, really, that you're more interested in. Interestingly enough, this is the reverse of resistors. So resistors in series, you just add them up. Resistors in parallel, it's this. So to calculate capacitance is the reverse of calculating resistance, which is quite interesting. <coughs> so those two kind of components are actually very approachable to us using conductive ink, and, and we're going to make a circuit using that. But they're not um, tremendously exciting circuits, so what I thought I would do is make a um, sound generator. In order to make a sound generator, what you need is some kind of oscillator. Now, oscillation is a, a really important factor in any electronic circuit. Now, if I think about a battery... ...and I connect that up to a capacitor, and then connect that to a resistor, put in a switch, then nothing's going to happen until I close that switch. When I close that switch, that capacitor is going to charge up. It's going to charge up so that it has, actually it's about two-thirds of the battery voltage that it charges up to. So it will take a charge and retain that charge. So if I close that for a little bit, that capacitor will uh, charge up, and then I open it. Nothing will happen. Unless I put a load on there, like a light bulb. If I put a light bulb on there, I close that switch, the light bulb won't light until that's charged, when that's charged, the light bulb will light, I take that off, the light bulb will stay lit until the work that that light bulb is doing drains the energy that's stored in the capacitor. That light bulb is actually a resistor. So what we think of isn't a light bulb per se, but another resistor. And we say that the capacitor charges up through that resistance, but discharges through that resistor. And so that simple circuit is actually a timing circuit because it will take time. It takes time for that capacitor to discharge. Now the time it takes to do that is actually fixed in relation to the values of the capacitor and the resistors. And that's how long it takes. And that's a very simple timing circuit. Now we can use that in conjunction with something called a 555 chip. Now the 555 is a ubiquitous chip. It costs very little money indeed. It's like um, 20 pence to 50 pence. It's, they make millions of them. They're really, really cheap and they're immensely useful. And you can get them in large packets called the um, NE555 or the tiny CMOS packets which uses less power. Uh, that's the ST555. They, they have the same effect. And if you look at it, there is uh, normally a little dot here or a little cup in here and that would be pin 1. So you have 8 pins, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Now we're not going to worry about the pin designations, if you're really interested in it, then you can look it up on the net, there's plenty of things on the net telling you. But the way you recognise pin 1 is you've got a dot, you get a little cup, when you look at the top of it, that one's pin 1, that's how you recognise it. And you can connect up the 555 timer in a whole series of ways, but a particularly useful way is something called the air stable 
Now the air stable uses external components, passive components, resistors and capacitors, to time a signal that comes out. Normally, to make it easy to understand, you have the supply rails and positive and the ground or the negative, you have the supply rails and they're always shown like that on electronic circuits so that they're readable by everybody and you have the supply rails and it starts to number one and the reason they put one there is because one is the ground you just connect one to the ground you have one, uh, we have check six to seven four eight and three we put them that way because, as I said, it just makes it easy to draw the circuit. Three is the output. And it outputs a square wave signal. <coughs> and that can be used to turn things off and on. So you can use that to turn um, a light off and on, uh, a relay off and on, or sound a speaker, which is just a, uh, a very fast moving solenoid if you like, and you can use that to turn that off and on. So I did an experiment about um, electrochemical exfoliation of um, graphite into graphene, and this circuit, or the circuit that we're going to go through in a minute, this circuit is actually um, one way of running a relay to perform that experiment. So when we look at that, Then 8 is connected to the supply. It's these three pins that actually control the air-stable operation. We connect 2 to 6. And here, we have a capacitor, we have a resistor, we have a resistor. So that is R, A, R, B, and C. And those are the timing, timing components, so it charges up through the resistor uh, network, so it's coming from here, charging it up. When the um, internal the chip closes it, that capacitor discharges through this resistor. And the resistor network and the size of these components is what determines the time it takes. And that time it takes is actually what fixes the frequency of the signal here. So, this gets connected here, and this one, 7, gets connected there. So that's how you connect this thing up. Now, <clears throat> again, on the net, there are lots of um, calculators and suggestions available for you on what the values of RA, RB, and C would be to give you a fixed frequency. Now, the formula for that is actually um, frequency is equal to... That. 1.44 over RA plus 2RB times C. Uh, if you work that one out, then you can work out the frequency that this signal is going to come out at. And again, plenty of programs to help you work that one out. One other thing to think about is that is one signal on off. And obviously that signal takes time. And that point, the time between the on and the off, is called the duty cycle. And you can also alter the duty cycle by changing the relationships of R and RB. And again, plenty of calculators available out there on the net. So this 555 timer in air stable configuration is uh, really essential to anything you want to do um, with signals. And building passive components out of the ink is the next thing we're going to do. So I'm going to um, go off now and walk you through how to actually paint a circuit using a 5.5 timer and um, this ink and a bit of paper.